This is our first lesson in organic chemistry, and we'll start by defining what it means to be organic. Now, when these terms were starting to be developed hundreds of years ago, things were being classified as being organic or either, or either organic or inorganic. And organic was described as something that came from living things. Plants and animals and, and uh, the, the matter from those species. And inorganic was everything else. So things like rocks and minerals. Rocks and minerals never came from living matter. Uh, metal. Glass, for example. So these are some materials that are described as inorganic. And uh, other than these sorts of things, they're known as organic. Now we've expanded that definition to not just be things that come from a natural source, but we've expanded it and defined it as the chemistry of carbon. Because we are, our life is carbon based, and so that, that encompasses the original definition. So it's true that living things and things that came from living sources are going to be uh, organic, but we can expand our definition to include uh, lots of other interesting things. Now what I love about organic chemistry is that it surrounds us in our everyday lives and I was really fascinated by the topic when I took it as an undergraduate. And uh, let's go through some examples of, of things we'll encounter throughout the course. So the products that we use uh, that improve our lives are, are, here are lots of examples of organic chemistry, medicines, drugs, the entire pharmaceutical industry uh, is, is the majority of those products are organic compounds, carbon containing compounds including pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, the things that protect our crops and uh, help feed people, dyes, inks, things that are colored and things, pigments, things that lend color to things can are, be organic, paints, the paint uh, industry is, is very important uh, to study organic chemistry and understand how we can make the paint uh, you know, longer lasting or more environment, environmentally friendly, gasoline, fuels, the, the petroleum industry, uh, is using organic molecules. We, we uh, distill crude oil into its various components. Each of those components are organic compounds and, and we find that they burn quite nicely and provide us energy. And cosmetics, shampoos and perfumes and those sorts of things. Um, so the personal care industry is also something that uh, definitely involves organic chemistry. And a lot of materials that uh, we use in our world, now natural materials as well as man-made materials. So if you take a look at the structure of paper or cotton, you'll see that those are, are uh, carbon chains, carbon containing compounds, as well as rubber and so tires, things that are made out of rubber. But then there are a lot of man-made uh, examples of these compounds. They're, they're known as polymers when we have these long chains of molecules like we do for, for cotton or rubber. And so some man-made ones are things like nylon and polyester. Those are organic compounds. All plastics that you can imagine. Vinyl, that's organic. As well as adhesives. So anything that is sticky or gooey is also an organic molecule. Liquid crystals, if you think about our LCD displays that we have on our, on our phones and our televisions, those are organic molecules, a lot of interesting research going on there. As well as nanotubes. Nanotubes are all carbon containing uh, uh, structures that, that go on, they're extremely strong and, and this is when we're looking into nanotechnology, nano uh, organic chemistry is really uh, leading the way and, and will, I'm, I'm sure, have some very exciting breakthroughs uh, in the years to come. And in nature, remember that organic chemistry is initially defined as having this relationship to living systems, and that's still quite true. So if you look at the structure, we will in just a minute, of, of proteins and fats and sugars, those are all organic molecules. So anything we eat that we digest is an organic molecule. Uh, the vitamins that, that, that are essential to our existence, things that we can taste or smell, those are organic molecules that we're interacting with, flavors and fragrances. Uh, hormones, steroids, the structure of DNA. So really all of the, um, uh, when you look at the field of biochemistry, these are all organic reactions in living systems. And so that's why it's critical to have a, a strong foundation in organic chemistry before you move on to biochemistry because you're gonna be studying organic reactions that are taking place in, in, uh, in living systems. So 
as you can see, uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting things that are in store for us. And as an organic chemist, uh, there, there's a, a wide variety of industries in which you could be involved, the pharmaceutical industry, petroleum, food, health and beauty, polymer, and the list goes on forever. So as a matter of fact, I was a biology major when I took organic chemistry as an undergraduate, and I was so uh, excited about the topic and found it so interesting that I ended up changing my ma major to chemistry and studying organic chemistry in graduate school. So uh, let's see what we have in store. Before we can get into some of the really fun stuff, let's make sure we review some chemistry basics because anyone taking organic chemistry should have had a year or so of general chemistry. And uh, while, while you've learned a lot of things in general chemistry, there are certain things that are going to be really critical to succeed in organic chemistry. So you want to make sure we review those so that you're ready to hit the ground running. So for example, let's think about electrons. Electrons are the things that are going to be doing all the bonding, doing all the reactions. And so it's really important we have a good understanding of what electrons uh, look like, how they behave. Remember, these are held in atomic orbitals around the nucleus, so we have S, P, D, F, those sorts of orbitals. And for uh, organic chemistry, we're, we're mostly just dealing with these S orbitals and P orbitals because that's uh, what carbon has available to us, and we're, we're studying the chemistry of carbon. And so if we think about the S orbitals and the P orbitals, let's, think, let's consider their energy uh, and, and their relative energy, okay? And so if you'll remember, the very first shell of electrons has just a single... Uh, orbital, the s orbital, that's available to it. That's the one s orbital, we call it. And then when we move to carbon, it now also has a second shell of electrons. And in that shell, we have two types of orbitals that are available. We have an s orbital, OK? But because it is now further from the nucleus, it's going to be higher in energy. So what I'm showing here is a relative uh, order of energy. The 2s orbital is higher in energy than the 1s. And then the p orbital, uh, it has a node, and, and it is that dumbbell shaped, and these are further still from the nucleus. The p orbitals are higher in energy still. And if you recall, there are going to be three different types of p orbitals in that second shell. So we can draw them at the same level. And this is the 2p. So we, what we want to remember is this general um, description of the relative energies. And the s orbital is going to be lower in energy, meaning more stable than the p orbitals. That's going to be important to us down the road. So we just want to make sure we have that in mind. OK, let's take a look at the periodic table. Now, again, we're going to, we just see here just a, a, a section of the periodic table because carbon is our uh, is the atom that we're going to be most concerned with, we're going to be involved with throughout this whole uh, year of organic chemistry, and really very few other atoms are going to be involved in our um, organic molecules. You know, definitely hydrogen, a lot of hydrogen in our molecules attached to carbon, then maybe nitrogen, oxygen, some of these halogens, okay? Possibly we'll see some of this down here, uh, the silicon, the phosphorus, um, or even the sulfur, okay? But, but really it's this very small region of the periodic table that we're going to be spending most of our time with. Okay, but, but some of our reagents and reactions will involve some other atoms as well. And we want to remember what's very important about the periodic table is that this column is the most uh, special here. This is the noble gases. These are the noble gases. And these elements are extremely stable. And uh, every other atom in the periodic table, every other element is trying to look like the noble gases. And uh, what that means is they want to have the same electronic configuration. And that imparts a special stability because an atom is going to be stable if it has a filled valence shell. That's going to be the, the ultimate goal that all atoms are seeking, and we know this as the octet rule. Okay, now um, hydrogen can't ever have an octet because this, it only has the 1s orbital. It can only hold two electrons. So for hydrogen, it'll have a filled s orbital, and that would be very stable. But for carbon and nitrogen and all the others, we want to have in our outer shell, we want to have two electrons in our s orbital. We want to have six electrons in our p orbital. This, is, this would be a filled shell. So <clears throat> that would move us all the way over to give a, a configuration that would be like uh, neon or argon or krypton, depending on what atom you're looking at. So for example, if we take a look at sodium, sodium metal, this is not a stable molecule, a uh, stable atom on its own because it has just one valence electron. 
But if sodium were to give up a valence electron to be sodium plus, that would bring it back to have the electronic configuration of neon making it extremely stable. So anytime we see sodium as part of a formula, we know that that sodium must be sodium plus if it's going to be stable. How about something like calcium or magnesium, something in the, in the second column here? Well, these have two valence electrons. That's not a filled shell. So the way that they can fill, uh, end up with a filled shell is to get rid of those two electrons. So we have things like magnesium, two plus is very stable, calcium, two plus. Those atoms like to have a plus two charge. And again, anytime we see them in a formula, we know that we can uh, think of that, that charge. Okay, lithium, potassium will have a plus one charge. How about the halides? Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, what would, what would make them stable? Well, to get all the way over to chlorine, we had to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. So if it had just one more, then it would have the electronic configuration of argon. That would be very, very stable because it would have a filled octet. So how can it do that? Well, it can gain an electron and have a negative charge. That would give it, instead of seven valence electrons, it would have eight valence electrons and have a filled octet. So the periodic table is a, is a critical resource for us and just a quick glance at the periodic table is going to um, remind us what charges certain atoms like to have. Of course, the atoms on the far left like to have positive charges, will have positive charges. The atoms on the uh, far right will have negative charges. Okay, we also learned something about electronegativity, and that's going to be a concept that's important to us in organic chemistry, going to help us, allow us to predict certain things. And uh, the one rule that we know here is that fluorine is the most electronegative element. And uh, so the periodic trends are such that as you move towards fluorine, moving either uh, to, the, to the right or moving up, that is going to increase your electronegativity. And what does it mean to be electronegative? It means you pull electron density toward yourself. So fluorine is very, very good at pulling electron density toward itself. Um, now, I'm not going to share with you the, the table of the numbers because we're not, we don't need to memorize the numbers. We need to be able to just kind of have a feel for, for who's more electronegative and, and who's not. So a few things that we should point out. Fluorine is the most electronegative atom. Most of us have, have an easy time remembering that. But you should also know that oxygen is the second most. Second most electronegative atom. So anytime you see an oxygen in a structure, you know right away that that oxygen is always pulling electron density toward itself. So that's a good fact to know. Okay. Um, and, and it's also important, it's also difficult to compare things that are not within the same column or within the same row. So it's also good to know that carbon has a very similar electronegativity to hydrogen. Now they're not the same number, but there is not a significant difference between those two. So it's good to remember that those, um, have, have similar electronegativities. Um, and just FYI, when you look up the electronegativities of nitrogen and chlorine, those are equal. And uh, so, so that's kind of how that, that balances out. But, but that's not, um, typically you're not having to memorize these numbers. If we know that fluorine is extremely electronegative and we know that oxygen is also extremely electronegative, that's going to get us through a lot. Um, and if you're comparing any two atoms that happen to be in the same column or the same row, then for sure we should be able to compare their electronegativity. So how about this example, comparing carbon to nitrogen? Which one would be more electronegative? Well, here's carbon, here's nitrogen. Since nitrogen is closer to fluorine, nitrogen is going to be more electronegative. Now let's talk about bonding. How do these elements come together to form bonds? We have two types of bonds. We have ionic bonds and covalent bonds. Uh, ionic bonds are what we're going to have if we, if, if we combine atoms that have large differences in electronegativity. So if we take something like sodium, which is on the far left of the periodic table, and combine it with chlorine, which is on the far right of the periodic table, we have, uh, and, and I've shown them here with just their valence electrons. Sodium has one, chlorine has seven. These are, neither of these species are happy. These are very unstable. They're very reactive um, because neither has a filled octet. 
So the way that they can um, end up satisfying this problem is we can get a transfer. We can have a transfer of an electron. The sodium can give up its electron and give it to chlorine. And what happens now is the sodium lost an electron, so it's positively charged. The chlorine gained the electron, so it's negatively charged. Okay, and now as a result of this transfer of electrons, you have stable filled octets. So we're going back to that octet, octet rule. We're going back to um, achieving that noble gas configuration. So in this situation, it would, it would be very useful to transfer the single electron and both would be, um, would be satisfied. This is described as a salt. An ionic bond is called a, uh, uh, is a representation of a salt when you have a plus and a minus charge. Okay, and it's a network structure. So it's not correct to describe an NaCl as a molecule. There's no such thing as a molecule of NaCl. There's a one-to-one -one ratio of those two, but every sodium cation is surrounded by chlorine uh, ions in the salt crystal structure, every chlorine is surrounded by sodiums, and so, and so on. Okay, so we'll try not to call it molecules, although that, that does happen sometimes um, accidentally, but instead it's a, it's a salt and it's a network structure. Okay, let's take a look at a different example where a transfer of electrons would not be so good, okay? And, and when we're going to have that is, uh, when we're gonna have covalent bonds rather than ionic, is when we have atoms that have similar electronegativities, okay? With sodium and chlorine, sodium, chlorine really, really wanted that electron because it's so electronegative, and sodium didn't want that electron because it's so electropositive. And so, again, that transfer makes sense. In a case like, that, like this, where we have a carbon, carbon has four valence electrons, and if we combine that with four hydrogen atoms, each with a single valence electron, okay, now the idea of each of those hydrogens donating an electron to carbon to fill its octet isn't a good idea because this carbon then would have four extra electrons that would have a negative four charge. That would be highly unstable. So instead what we do is we share the electrons. Okay, this is still unstable, just like before, because no one has a filled octet. But if we were to share the electrons between the nuclei, so that this hydrogen now that sees two electrons, that remember that's the filled octet for hydrogen, that gives it a noble gas configuration. And the carbon now sees eight electrons. Okay, everyone gets to have a filled octet, uh, but we don't have any charges ensuing. Okay, so this is, this is a um, stable situation. And th these three lines kind of mean that the equivalent of this is instead of drawing these two shared electrons as, a, as two dots, what we do is we draw a line to represent uh, what, what's known as a covalent bond. So every time we draw a line connecting two atoms, this represents two shared electrons, two shared electrons, and we call that a covalent bond. And carbon is very good at forming covalent bonds. That's why uh, so many of its structures are so stable and, 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 uh, and, and throughout so many different types of uh, interesting products and compounds. Now by doing this, by doing this bonding and sharing these electrons, we now have, again, we have stable and we have filled valence orbitals. So this is a, a good arrangement. And what we have now is this is described, this, this guy is called methane. We're gonna be learning these names shortly. And this is a molecule. This is a discrete molecule, a discrete stable group of atoms that is uh, independent of other, of other um, molecules. So this is a methane molecule and that's what we have and we have covalent bonding. So the way we decide between ionic and covalent is we compare the atoms that are coming together and decide if they wanna be shared or if they want to transfer electrons. If they're all kind of in the same area of the periodic table, again, like carbon, all the neighboring atoms around carbon, those are going to prefer to, do, to be covalently bound. If we see anything off on the far uh, left of the periodic table, the, the metals, those are going to want to be charged species, and so those will always be ionic compounds, ionic species. Okay, now 
Is there anything between strictly covalent and strictly ionic? In fact, this is kind of a continuum. It's not always so clear cut whether something is completely ionic or completely covalent. And especially when you're looking at the covalent situation, when you have two atoms that are sharing electrons, those two electrons are not necessarily being equally shared between the two atoms because those atoms may not have identical or very similar electronegativities. So in that situation, we have what's known as a polar bond or a polar covalent bond, and that's what we have if we have a significant difference in electronegativity. So for example, let's take a look at a carbon-oxygen bond. Do these have the same electronegativity or similar electronegativity? What do we know about oxygen? We know oxygen is the second most electronegative atom in the periodic table. So we know that this oxygen is very electronegative, and what's happening is it pulls electron density. These two electrons being shared by the carbon and the oxygen are being pulled toward the oxygen. And so they're not being equally shared. And what we have is a, a, is a polar situation. We have a dipole situation here where, this, uh, where the oxygen is partially minus. We use this delta symbol to represent a partial charge. And the carbon is partially positive. So there's a couple ways we can show this represent this polar bond. We can draw this line, this, this arrow points in the direction of the, of, of the electrons being drawn, or, and or we could have a partial plus and partial minus to represent the two um, electron deficiency on the carbon and electron richness of this oxygen. Okay, how about a carbon-hydrogen bond? Do those have a significant difference in electronegativity? Now again, we need to know this without looking at a table. In fact, they do not have a significant difference. Um, uh, so this is described as a nonpolar bond because there's no significant difference in the electronegativity. Okay, this carbon-oxygen bond we describe as a polar bond. This is a polar bond, and this is a nonpolar bond. We're going to need, need to be able to. Um, describe bonds this way. How about if we had carbon attached to a halogen? The letter X is going to represent a halogen. Whenever we see that in organic chemistry, the X will represent something like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Well, remember, fluorine is the most electronegative, so for sure that's the most polar, the more electronegative. And in fact, it, it, it does decline throughout, but for um, every one of them, iodine, it's a, it's a little less uh, extreme. But for, for the most part, when you attach a halogen to a carbon, you do expect electron density to be t pulled toward the halogen. So we'll have a partial minus and a partial plus. And these are also polar bonds. This is going to be important to us because it's going to help um, describe the relationship of these, uh, the, these carbons when they're in a structure. This carbon is electron deficient, and it's going to have certain reactivities as a result of that. Now, when we look at a molecule as a whole, we could decide whether that molecule is polar or nonpolar. But in doing so, what we have to consider is the geometry of the molecule, the shape of the molecule. Okay, here's an example. This is carbon dioxide, and as shown, this is this, the geometry of this molecule is shown. We'll we'll talk later about how to predict the geometry of a molecule. But this is a linear molecule. So although this carbon oxygen bond is polar, and this carbon oxygen bond is polar. When we look at those two vectors, we see that they are pulling equally in opposite directions, which means they cancel out. And they have no net dipole moment. So this is actually a nonpolar molecule. So in determining polarity of the molecule, not only do we have to look for polar bonds, but then we have to de determine the relationship of those polar bonds to one another to see what the overall dipole moment is. Okay, here we have a molecule that is a bent molecule, and so we have this same C, you know, CO bonds that are pulling in the direction of the oxygen, and while they both have the right and the left, uh, leftward components cancel, they both have an upward component, and there is nothing to cancel that in a downward direction. So this does have a net dipole moment, and so we describe this as a polar molecule. Okay, how about this next one? Here we have a bent shape as well, but what polar bonds do we have? We know carbon-carbon bonds are nonpolar, and we also know that carbon-hydrogen bonds are nonpolar. So because there are no polar bonds, 
there can't exist a net dipole moment. So in this case, it doesn't matter what the geometry is because we have no polar bonds. Okay, and finally, so this is a nonpolar molecule. Any molecule with just carbons and hydrogens will have to be nonpolar. And let's look at this last one, NaOH. Now, what do you know about the bonding of this, of this uh, species, NaOH? Now, I just said that if we have a, a, a formula containing something like a sodium, what do you know about that sodium? How does sodium exist in order to be stable? It must be positively charged. So this is actually an Na+, plus, which means this OH must be an OH-. minus. This must be an ionic compound. Now, we're going to need to be able to make that evaluation when we look at a formula. So what does this really look like? It looks like we have Na+, plus, and then for an ionic bond, we don't draw a line between the two. We just show the two ions next to each other, and we have an OH-. minus. This is the actual structure of uh, sodium hydroxide, NaOH. And so this is ionic. So we don't describe this as a polar molecule. We describe this as an ionic molecule. Okay, because it has full charges. It doesn't have a, a partial plus and a partial minus. We could also show up here that the, this oxygen is partial minus. Looks like a little bit of a plus. Partial minus. And these carbons have some partial positive character because of that polarity. Okay, but this, is, this has full charges, not, any, not partial charges. So we describe this as ionic rather than polar. And, um, and hydroxide, this here, is described as a covalent ion because it is an ion, it's negatively charged, but it has covalent bonds as well. The, the bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen is a shared uh, covalent bond. So we call that a covalent ion. And sodium hydroxide has both ionic and covalent bonds in the structure. Okay, and, and finally, as a little bit of an intro and, and a catch up, let's talk about the use of line drawings for organic chemistry because this is a shorthand notation that organic chemists use um, constantly as a way to save some time. Okay, and what we do is we draw lines to represent carbon chains, and the definition is that any end point of a line represents a carbon, and any intersection or bend, I should, or bends, represent a carbon atom. Sometimes it'll look more like a bend. Okay, so for example, this, car this carbon chain has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. So the way that this can be represented is we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this zigzag line or line drawing notation represents eight carbons. This end carbon, this end point is a carbon, and any bend here or intersection of these two lines, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, and uh, what we do is we, we draw the lines to represent the carbons, and then we omit the hydrogens that are attached to those carbons. And we can do that because we know that carbon likes to have four bonds to be stable. Any neutral carbon is going to have four bonds. And so, uh, you know, stable one that we're going to see. And so, uh, we, we know that this end carbon has just one bond shown to, to a carbon. We know the other three bonds must be to hydrogen. So this must be a CH3. Any end line, any, any uh, line that ends in just at a point is a CH3 group. Okay, and this carbon, what, is, what do you know this carbon looks like? It has two bonds to carbon, so the other two bonds must be to hydrogen. This is what a CH2 looks like. So very quickly, we can draw very complex organic molecules uh, by using this notation, and, uh, but, but we need to gain some experience with that, and we need to recognize that there's a lot of hydrogens on this structure that are just not being shown. So this organic molecule, this eight carbon organic molecule is known as octane. We're going to be getting into uh, some of this nomenclature down the road, and, and uh, we've heard of octane. That's one of the components of gasoline. You have the octane reading when you, uh, when you fill your car up. And so this is one example of you know, an organic molecule being a good fuel. Uh, th these are some of the compounds that we use in our, in our car. Uh, now what do we do if we have an atom other than carbon? Well, we just draw that atom. So we have a two carbon chain, one, two, and then we have an oxygen attached to that. Now this hydrogen we have to include because it's not a car, it's, we only omit the hydrogens attached to carbon. So all other hydrogens are shown. So this represents this structure. This is called ethanol 
or ethyl alcohol. This is the alcohol. There are many alcohols we'll, we'll learn um, as, a, as a class of compounds. But uh, this is the alcohol that is grain alcohol, that is the kind that, uh, that is, is drinkable. This, this molecule, we can redraw this as a line drawing. All we would be doing is, is replacing those carbons. So if we have a double bond, if we have a multiple bond, we just connect two points with, uh, with a double line instead of a single line. And uh, this molecule is called acetic acid. And this is the uh, compound that's in vinegar that gives it its characteristic smell and taste. So this, this, these carboxylic acid groups like these we'll find uh, are, have acidity to them. That's what gives it that bite and kind of burns a little bit when you taste vinegar. So there's, again, organic chemistry and flavors and fragrances. Um, how would we represent this one? Well, we have a CO double bond, and then we have a carbon, and then we have a double bond to another carbon. So you could draw it this way, or you could draw it, doesn't matter what angle we do, we're going to be showing actually how these molecules can kind of rotate around and, and achieve different shapes and conformations. Uh, and a lot of times, in this particular case, we like to show this hydrogen. So this is kind of the one uh, exception to the rule where we leave off the hydrogens. Usually shown, this hydrogen, when it's attached to a CO double bond, um, then, then a lot, we usually draw it that way. It's acceptable to leave it off, but don't be surprised when you see it on there still. And uh, carbons not only can make very long chains, but they can also form rings. So we'll have cyclic compounds. So when we have a six-membered ring like this, we simply draw a hexagon. So, so cyclic compounds are very easy to draw with line drawings by just drawing the polygon, a pentagon, or a, or a square. Um, and this also has three double bonds. So we would just show that every other carbon is connected by two bonds. This is, and, and we can leave off all these hydrogens. We don't need to do that. We know because there are one, two, three bonds shown, the, there must be a fourth bond, and that's to, to hydrogen. So this would be the representation of benzene. This molecule is called benzene. That is uh, an interesting molecule. And uh, th this is actually known to be carcinogenic. That means it causes cancer. This is, benzene is one of the many dozens of carcinogenic compounds that are in cigarette smoke. Uh, and we'll be seeing chemistry of, of benzene and related compounds down the road. And then, uh, you know, some of the exercises that you'll want to do is, is being able to convert from condensed formulas to line drawing back and forth to get some experience because you really want to become fluent in these line drawings. It's going to save you so much time down the road. And you're also going to have to be able to work with them, so you need to be able to interpret them. So, for example, this guy, this, this is pretty complex, but we have a carbon with three CH3 groups. So here's that carbon, and we just draw three lines coming off to represent those CH3s. And then he's attached to a carbon. And see how this, th these carbons have no hydrogens on here? That tells me that there's a triple bond between those carbons. There's no other, oh, I forgot we're doing a line drawing here. There's a triple bond between those carbons because there's no hydrogens. And then we have another carbon with two chlorines on it. So very funny looking line drawing uh, for, for a, a complex molecule. That, but the, you know, this condensed formula takes a lot of deconvoluting as you work it out as well. So, so um, we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about how to draw Lewis structures and, and come up with these, these um, various line drawings and, and formulas. So, so uh, this is just a brief introduction into the, the process and the rules. But what's nice is now that you have an understanding of what these line, these line drawings uh, represent, now we can take a look at some examples of just how diverse organic molecules can be. So for example, this very first structure is called vanillin. Why do you think it's called vanillin? This is the major component of vanilla extract, the vanilla bean. So this is what tastes and smells like vanilla. So, uh, you know, if you were to buy artificial vanilla, it would be this compound, just the vanillin, where the natural uh, extract would have mostly vanillin, but then also dozens or, you know, maybe hundreds of, of other uh, constituents in there. And that's what gives it a very rich, deep flavor um, compared to the artificial, which has just this one component. 
And look at this structure. This is it. It has a benzene ring. We can see a benzene ring in here. And then just carbons, oxygens, and hydrogens. That's it. But depending on how those atoms are put together, they can have, they'll have completely different reactivities and behaviors. Okay, this next molecule is interesting. Again, just carbons, hydrogen, oxygen. This molecule is called carvone. And I've built a model of carvone here. We're going to be looking at some of these three-dimensional shapes. It's called stereochemistry when you consider the three-dimensional shape of a molecule. We have our six-membered ring in here, and we have some double bonds. And what's very interesting about this molecule is on the six-membered ring, we have this group. If this group is in this position compared to this position, it'll have very different uh, flavor and fragrance. In one position, it smells and tastes like spearmint, like you might have in gum. And in the other position, it smells and tastes like caraway, like the little seeds you have in rye bread. So we'll, we'll see some really fascinating uh, changes that happen by considering the stereochemistry, the three-dimensional shape of certain molecules. Okay, now I said everything that we eat and digest is an organic molecule. Let's take a look at some of those structures. This is the structure of a protein. So when we eat proteins, these are uh, amino acids that are linked together. And this R group here, whenever we use the letter R, it just means that we have some kind of carbon chain. So there's a wide variety. I just gave you a basic structure here. Depending on what that R group is and depending the order in which these, these are put together and how long it is, is what defines what protein you have and how, how does it behave as an enzyme, what function does it have in the body, and so on. But, but look, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a carbon um, it's a carbon and nitrogen uh, chain, but definitely an organic molecule. Sucrose, this is the structure of sucrose. Uh, it's called, so table sugar or cane sugar has this. So all sugars, starches, saccharides are organic molecules. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. And that's all. We put them together this way. Here we have a six-membered ring with an oxygen. Here we have a five-membered ring with an oxygen, and they're linked by a, an oxygen bridge. And sometimes we draw bonds um, with some shading. We, we draw it as a wedge, and that's another way to represent three-dimensionality in stereochemistry. If a, if a bond is wedged, that means it's projecting out toward the viewer. And if it's dashed, it means it's behind the page. It's, it's kind of hidden. So that's something that you, know, you can maybe understand what, um, what you're seeing when you're looking at these line drawings. And, and down the road, we'll, we'll explain it in much more detail, so you'll really have a great feeling for these structures. Um, th this is the structure of a triglyceride. So when we're looking at lipids, fats, oils, greasy things, it has this general structure where it has these three groups, a three carbon chain with these three oxygen groups on it. And I've just put an N here because these are really, 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 really long carbon chains. Sometimes they have double bonds in them. Uh, sometimes they're all single bonds. And, and that makes the difference between saturated or polyunsaturated or monounsaturated fats, so we know how important those are in our, our diets, trans fats, and that, that's all explained by looking at the structure of the organic molecules involved. So fats, sugars, proteins, everything that we're digesting is organic. Um, all of the, the compounds undergoing reactions and, and um, involved in our body are organic. This is the structure of cholesterol. It's a steroid. Any, any steroid in our body is, uh, has, has a similar structure, this, this four this um, group of four rings kind of defines the steroid structure and then various groups attached to it make it one or the other. We know how, cholesterol, how important cholesterol is to our, to our health. Uh, here's a structure of vitamin C. Again, carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, that's it. But when we put them together this way, this now uh, is, a, is an essential vitamin and keeps us very healthy, uh, re real important part of our diet. And you can see here that that structure has been elucidated with, with some certain stereochemistries as shown. Uh, here's this uh, subunit, one, one component of the DNA. We know DNA is that double helix that goes on and on. And so these are the groups that link up um, to make each of those long chains. You can see, again, um, we've got kind of like a sugar backbone here. kind of looks like the sugar part where we have the five-membered ring. And then, uh, and then you know, some, some groups that look a little like benzene with some nitrogens in there and some phosphate group here. So, you know, DNA, our, our blueprint for our uh, reproduction is also, um, is also an organic-based molecule. And then, of course, the pharmaceutical industry and drugs uh, of any kind, things that, are, that have an effect on our, on our central nervous system, on our, on our body in any way, um, you know, 
Almost all of these are organic molecules is the structure of aspirin. Uh, you know, again, very simple molecule, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, with a, with a benzene ring in there. Um, that's the structure of aspirin. Now, remember I said benzene itself is carcinogenic, um, but just having the benzene unit as part of a structure does not mean all of a sudden that everything it has is carcinogenic. Or, uh, you know, uh, obviously, um, you know, uh, aspirin is, is, is uh, very good, actually good for your health, heart health uh, and, and in many cases, and, um, and has pain relieving uh, effects and, and uh, fever reducing effects. And so as soon as you attach groups to the benzene ring, it's no longer benzene itself and it has very different properties, physical properties, chemical properties. Here's a structure of nicotine. So that's the component in uh, cigarettes that makes it so addictive. Here's caffeine. You can see a lot of drugs have nitrogens in them. They have a, a lot of reactivity that we'll be studying uh, throughout organic chemistry. Uh, here's, a, here's a compound that is colored. So this is called orange 2. It's used as a dye. And it turns out that all, having these double bonds, one right after another like this, having a large network of double bonds like that, um, it's called a, a conjugated pi system. Having those uh, interact with light in such a way that they, we perceive them as to be colored. They, they, um, they reflect certain colors of the spectrum. And so that's uh, an example of a, a pigment that is organic based. Uh, this is the structure of Roundup, a commercial uh, herbicide that's used. It's weed killer. You know, and, and again, if you have uh, weeds growing in your in your yard or uh, termites invade your house or cockroaches, we don't even hesitate. Uh, we're expecting that there's a product out there that will uh, kill those critters or, or take care of the weeds. And so there's uh, chemists hard at work researching this to make them as uh, safe for humans as possible, safe for our crops as possible, but get rid of the pests and, uh, and the fungus and, and all that um, uh, and the weeds so that we can protect our crops and, and have them grow in a, in a healthy and safe way. This molecule always fascinates me. This is an example of a pheromone. A pheromone is, uh, uh, is an example of the chemicals that insects use to communicate with one another. This is a, a sex pheromone. And so this is what the housefly uses to, um, to attract a mate. It, it lets off this, this chemical and, uh, and then uh, a, a fly of the opposite sex is going to be attracted to that and that's how they can get together with a mate. And, and look at this structure. It's just a giant carbon chain, has one double bond here with this particular stereochemistry where they're both pointing in the same direction. And that's it. If you take rid of that, get rid of that double bond, no effect on the house fly. You know, or if you add another group somewhere else, no effect. So that, I really find that fascinating and, and interesting. And, uh, and, and you might wonder, well, well, why do we know what the sex pheromone of a house fly looks like? What application could there be for that? Well, let's think about um, maybe a, a roach motel type thing where you have a, a bait um, that you have some poison in for, you know, an ant trap or a roach trap or something like that, or a, a, a a yellow jacket trap, those sorts of things you might have seen. Well, you know, we put that under a sink and we can't just hope that they randomly walk in there and, and eat on the poison, right? We need to find some way to attract them. Well, wouldn't it be a great idea to take the, the sex pheromone for that insect and put it in the box so that when a roach is walking by, it kind of turns around and says, hey, there's a, there's a party in there, let's go check that out. And they go in and of course there's just poison for them to feed on and then they take that back to their colonies and, and we can wipe out the whole colony. So it's not by accident that, that they're being drawn to this box. And so pheromones could have a, an important uh, role in that. Uh, here's a, a brief structure of a carbon nanotube. So, so if you take a look very closely, you can see that it's a benzene ring fused with another and another and another. And when you fuse benzene rings together, you get a, a sheet you get a flat structure. In fact, that is the, that's called graphite. That's the structure that we have in pencils and that, that allows you to you know, trace, trace a line across a piece of paper. Is, is That's graphite. Well, if you take that sheet and you roll it up, you're going to end up with a tube. And this is a tube that can extend for very long distances. And, and because carbon-carbon bonds are so strong, it ends up being a very, it's a flexible, yet extremely durable, strong, lightweight material. And so nanotubes um, or, uh, are really revolu revolutionizing a lot of materials. You're seeing it being used for, you know, like uh, creating a, a really strong, durable bicycle that's, that's super lightweight that you can carry easily. 
those sorts of applications. Uh, do keep an eye out in the future for uh, nanotechnology and, and you'll most definitely see organic chemistry at the forefront of that. And then here's an example of a polymer. And a, a polymer is described as a long chain of, of uh, carbon atoms with repeating units. And this is called polyvinyl chloride. So you can see we have a chlorine here uh, periodically. And this goes on and on in each direction. That's called PVC for short. And so if you've heard of PVC, PVC piping, that's the piping that we use for water pipes. If you have a sprinkler system in your yard, something like that, those are called PVC pipes. And so this is uh, kind of what a, an example of an organic polymer looks like. And by varying the group that's hanging off and, and the spacing of those groups and, and maybe the interaction between the chains, you can have tremendously different physical properties. And so let's take a look at some of those. I have a, a slide here with just a, a very small set of examples of polymers. We just talked about PVC. So that's something that you have in pipes, you know, your shower curtains, how great it is to have, uh, you know, something that's water resistant and mold res mildew resistant, you know, that we can have uh, to use in our showers the car seats we have in our car that are, that are vinyl. Uh, polyurethane is something that we can make kind of foamy and squishy. So things like mattresses or your soles of your tennis shoes, or they could be used um, as a fiber for spandex clothing, very stretchy. So some polymers might have that stretchy um, uh, physical property. Polystyrene is something that you can also kind of foam up and make it very lightweight, so styrofoam. Uh, is polystyrene, but you can also make it, uh, depending on how it's processed and how it's cast, you can make it also hard and see-through, like for plastic cups or, um, or, or you know, non, not see-through. Uh, or toys can be made of, you know, all the plastic toys are, are made of a variety of different polymers. Polyethylene is, uh, is the plastic that's used for certain plastic wrap or sandwich bags. There's a few different polymers that can be used for that. Polyacrylamide is the polymer that's in diapers that make them so super absorbent of water uh, so that uh, you know, they, they really can uh, hold a lot of water and, and be, last a long time. Uh, adhesives, as I mentioned, those are all polymer based. So things that make tape stick, post-it notes, all those sorts of things. Anything sticky or gooey is going to be actually an example of a polymer. Teflon is an example of a polymer. The nonstick coating that we have on our uh, pots and pans is a, is a polymer. Uh, polymethyl methacrylate is uh, what's used as ple plexiglass. So the, the huge walls that you have in aquariums that are really thick and really durable, those are examples of ple plexiglass, as is the, the plastic and eyeglasses or hard contact lenses. That's, uh, that, those are more polymers. The fibers and fabrics, so, um, you know, obviously uh, some clothes are 100% cotton, um, but, you know, those uh, don't stretch very well. They kind of sag over time. They don't hold their color very well. And so by using man-made fibers, we can really uh, not only dramatically vary our clothing, but also make it a lot more durable and stain resistant and, uh, and have all sorts of, you know, very stretchy, all sorts of interesting properties. So, again, things like nylon, lycra, rayon, polyester, um, you know, additives to your clothes. Polyacrylonitrile is what we have for carpets. So carpet fibers uh, also are, are synthetic um, to make them a lot more durable and longer lasting. And then you can even have, uh, you know, polymers that are incredibly durable, even stronger than, than steel in some cases. So like Kevlar is uh, a polymer that's used for lightweight bulletproof vests, um, you know, or it, it, they can use them in tires, they use them for uh, boat holes to make them very uh, strong. So, you know, if you think back to uh, a thousand years ago, how, how did uh, someone protect themselves in battle? Well, they put on a, a metal helmet and a, co a coat of armor, uh, you know, that's all metal. And they had to kind of walk around with this, probably needed help getting dressed. And, and it's very awkward and very heavy. And you get pretty fatigued very quickly. Uh, you know, you have no visibility because they, they didn't have any plastic shields that could go over it and glass doesn't, you know, there's probably no glass at the time, but glass wouldn't be very safe. So now you think about, you know, today's military and, and the lightweight, movable uh, fabrics that they have that are bullet resistant and, you know, really protect, protect you, but also allow you to function. 
um, you know, and the goggles that are plastic and see-through and durable and, and protective. So, so really, as you can see, just with this very brief introduction that, that what we're going to be learning in organic chemistry really does affect our everyday lives and, and we'll find examples of it all around. Uh, and and I, I look forward to, uh, to exploring more with you and we'll do that in the future. Thanks very much for visiting.